Good morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Dimitriotis, Dr. Lamb, Dr. Naba, Dr. Martin, for the real privilege of being here and talking about more than just the combat casualties that are in uniform, but also casualties that are uh, local nationals and civilians. These are my opinions only. I have no financial disclosures and I have no conflicts of interest, although I do have an interest in conflicts. Uh, so we're going to be uh, talking about these things here, the different conflicts, our trauma system, the medical rules of engagement, and humanitarian, humanitarian care, and we'll go through some data on that, and then I'll give you kind of my opinion on that. But just kind of going through the conflicts in Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan, um, uh, the military divides our system into geographic combatant commands, and CENTCOM is central command. CENTCOM consists of Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Jordan, Kuwait, Iran, and so it's a CENTCOM theater of operations. So, uh, you know, you have to have some military jargon and a military talk. And so uh, operations in CENTCOM are still ongoing, mostly in Iraq and in Syria, and the war in Afghanistan concluded in August 2021. And uh, Really, these are the longest combat operations in U.S. military history. And, uh, you know, while they transitioned into partner uh, uh, capability and partner sustainment operations, they really, you know, were conflict. Over 1.9 million U.S. military personnel completed over 3 million tours of duty. Uh, and really what we saw from this, a lot of lessons learned from the battlefield, everything from the resurgence of tourniquets to whole blood, transport time, critical care nurses. So we really improved our military trauma system and there was a reciprocity with that. I think everybody recognizes that with the civilian trauma system as well. And we heard a lot this morning about MILSIV partnerships. And if you think about the partnerships during times of war with large generations of combat casualties, the civilians have an opportunity to learn from lessons on the battlefield during times of peace, when we're not seeing battlefield, uh, battlefield trauma, we really have to leverage our civilian partnerships. And uh, so in terms of humanitarian response, NGOs and humanitarian actors are in CENTCOM. I mean, as we know, they're all over the world. But we were many times side by side, but couldn't really interact with them because of uh, mostly rules on their part. But, uh, but, you know, we did provide humanitarian care and would occasionally work with humanitarian uh, units as well. And uh, in CENTCOM, there's been billions of dollars of international aid over the last 20 years. This is just to show how many different countries uh, were in, involved in combat operations and peace sustainment in operations in Afghanistan. When I was there last was in 2020 and 2021, and uh, over 53 nations were in Kabul, where at the base that I was at. So it really was an international uh, coalition. And these are uh, the places that I've been between Iraq and Afghanistan. I don't have Syria on the uh, map, but I was, had the opportunity to go there last month. Uh, at one point, I thought about buying some real estate in Kabul when my four-month deployment turned into a 14-month deployment, but uh, you know, it probably wasn't a very good investment. But uh, I've had my opportunity uh, to go to certain places and support military operations. So in terms of casualties, just for some background, in Iraq, about just over 32,000 U.S. casualties, close to 5,000 deaths, and this is also uh, the all DOD casualties. And then uh, in Afghanistan, there were three different operations. Again, the military divides things into Operation, Operation Enduring Freedom, Inherent Resolve, and Operation Freedom Sentinel. And there were about 22,000 wounded in action or casualties, and close to 3,000 deaths. Now, when you think about that, that's a lot. Those numbers are a lot, but they're not anything compared to World War II, Korea, or even Vietnam. But when you think about the humanitarian casualties, okay, the civilians, the local national civilians, there's likely well over a million and close to 450,000 deaths of local civilians uh, during these conflicts. So now we're gonna briefly talk about the military trauma system and the continuum of care. So when you guys are at I guess it's not LA County anymore, LA General, right? When you guys are there, when you go from the trauma bay to the uh, OR, you're maybe an elevator ride or around the corner and you might stop at the CT scanner. That's, your, that's the system there. Our system is sometimes uh, divided by two helicopter trips and a 4,000 mile plane ride, right? So our system of care is a little bit different. It starts with role one care, pre-hospital care. And I think most people have now heard of tactical combat casualty care, it really emphasized bleeding control first. And if you look at these pictures, this is three quadruple 
amputees that participated in a race. So this is something that wouldn't have been able to be possible if they didn't all have multiple tourniquets on each extremity. So tactical combat casualty care and pre-hospital bleeding control has really revolutionized our trauma system. And I think we see that with the civilian as well. And then role two and role three care. Role two is considered damage control, uh, damage control surgical care. And we sometimes have the challenge of uh, being able to do enough but not being able to do too much if you're really well resourced and you're probably not far forward enough. And then role three care is the highest level of care on the battlefield. And that's where humanitarian care or local national care stops. And really when you look at what's been accomplished at role two and role three military treatment facilities over the last 20 years, uh, overall it's been relatively impressive. And then after US, people who are eligible for our system of care, then they move by fixed wing transport to Longville, Germany and then fixed wing transport back to the States. That can happen anywhere between 48 hours hours and a week, but if you think about that, that, that trip is sometimes an elevator ride in a civilian hospital. So it's a very different kind of continuum of care. And then uh, we've, we've gotten very good over the last 20 years at amputee care, uh, osteointegration for amputees, prosthetics, and I think that's also been had some reciprocity with the civilian side as well. This is one of the very early triple amputees of the war that I had a chance to take care of both downrange and then back at Walter Reed. Uh, so now we're going to talk about medical rules of engagement, or we call them MRO. So I have to say MedRO, CONOPS, you can't have a military talk without you know, dazzling you guys with all of our jargon and you know, acronyms that we have. But medical rules of engagement and concept of operations, really this is a command decision. This isn't a doctor decision. I think if doctors or nurses had the opportunity, we would always be doing this. But this is a command decision and it's based on lots of different things, uh, what's going on. And humanitarian care is not all trauma. Uh, you know, particularly in Afghanistan where iodine levels are low, I'd see a lot of people come in. When they found out there was a female surgeon at a little tent hospital in the middle of nowhere, Afghanistan, people were lining up because a lot of the women won't seek care other places or they don't have the money to go somewhere. So, you know, I uh, was doing goiters with an orthopedic surgeon, big goiters in a tent uh, on my first deployment. And then, you know, you'd also see people that you couldn't help. This is a kid with a horrible osteosarcoma. And there's nothing that we can do for him. You know, we would give uh, sometimes advice or we could get money from some of the units to send them into Pakistan to see if they could be seen by a pediatric oncologist. But sometimes it was just talking to the families and they appreciated it. You know, they appreciated having a, you know, a surgeon from the United States be able to talk to them about that. And then you are force multiplier as medical. So when a Marine is, you know, doing an uh, operation in a village and people come up to him and say, my child has had, you know, a major problem. This was a botched circumcision that they were treating with mud. It was a child with horrible hypospadias. And uh, after consulting with the urologist, came up with a plan and was able to, uh, to fix his urethra. Uh, so while doing this, though, you have to maintain mission readiness. So you have to be sure that if you're operating on a goiter and it's going to take you three hours, uh, that if all of a sudden trauma start coming in, you have a plan. You can't never, ever not be ready for trauma. We're there to take care of trauma casualties. And so if we're not ready for that, so when every time we make a decision to do humanitarian care, especially non-trauma, we have to think about it. And I really believe that the scalpel is more powerful than the 50 cal. You know, if you're taking care of a village elder's kid, or if you're doing, going something, just doing anything medical, and your base is a base in a high activity area, all of a sudden you notice over the ensuing week, the rockets slow down, you know. So I, I think that this actually helps us stay safe, being able to provide this goodwill. Linguists are an absolute essential part of the team. There's so many different dialects. Even if you learn basic, you know, Pashtun or Dari or Arabic, you know, there's so many dialects. So linguists become extremely important, especially when you're keeping patients over the night there with you all the time. And then you must have an understanding of cultural norms, as you can imagine. And you know, I thought there was going to be an issue being a female, and it wasn't. Uh, the, women, the only issue was I saw a lot more women and children. They would, they felt comfortable coming from the villages. But in terms of the men, you know, there wasn't really a problem because they really respect Western education. So you know, I thought it was going to be an issue, and it, uh, and it wasn't. Okay, so now we're going to go over some data. 
Uh, we're going to go over some data about humanitarian care. Now, when you go to look at what type of care has been provided by ICRC, MSF, Samaritan's Purse, you name the NGO that's been doing it, there's really no comprehensive data set. You can't find good data on surgical disease, trauma care, resource needs. You can find descriptive things, but there really hasn't been a huge look at data in the humanitarian space. And it's important to help understand the resources, especially when you see what's going on in Ukraine, you know, understanding the resources that are needed when you don't have data from previous conflicts is really tough. So what we did was we used the Department of Defense Trauma Registry, which is um, all the trauma patients from Iraq and Afghanistan, including local nationals, to look at this data. Uh, the, this was observational retrospective. We compared civilians to non-NATO coalition personnel. We did that for multiple reasons, and then their variables were gender, age, theater of operations, and injuries. And then we looked at what are the resources, transfusion, uh, what types of operations, and what types of procedures are these. So here's some data. Uh, there was a total of 29,000 or close to 30,000 people in the cohort. You can see that in the civilian population, more were women, which makes sense because there's not as many women in the, uh, in the NATO coalition and the, um, and the partner forces. And then compared to the partner forces, a lot more kids, right? That makes sense. You're not going to be sending, well, there shouldn't be any soldiers less than 12, right? And then, and then there's very rare to find them over 50. So in the civilian population, we had more of the extremes of age. I want to spend a second and talk about children. I did not think, especially on my first appointment, I mean, I know now that I was going to be doing so much pediatrics or delivering babies or doing stuff like that. Children are unquestionably like a victim of war, and you have to kind of, if your mindset's not ready for that, that you're going to be taking care of it, it can be a bit of a challenge. One of the first mass cows that I took care of was 34 kids. A school that was just outside our base was hit by multiple rockets. And I mean, you're not prepared. I mean, I wasn't emotionally prepared for that. We were prepared as a team. But the whole base really kind of uh, was shaken by that. And I mean, even since then, I haven't managed a pediatric mass cal of over 30 patients. I mean, so these are lessons that you learn sometimes the hard way. And you can see, if you can see the medic on the bottom there, you can see kind of the drain on their face, taking care of kids if you haven't prepared for it. Okay, so in these partnerships that Rachel uh, and uh, Dr. Chow were talking about, the importance of doing some pediatric trauma. And then uh, looking at some more demographics, when comparing civilian to our non-NATO coalition partners, more of the civilian side and the MTFs, but they can't really move out of the theater of operations. So that's part of the reason and because of their injuries. Now looking at injuries, non-battle injury uh, was higher in the civilian population. Now if you look at this child, this child was, uh, was, was picking up an IED. So picking up an IED and tried to put it diffuse, I don't know what he was trying to do, but it was in his mouth and obviously blew his face off. So this is a non-battle injury, even though it involved an IED. Uh, involved a huge reconstruction. You got to innovate a lot. Like we didn't have all these OMFS kits, and there's also a lot of phone calls when you're planning an operation like this. Burns are a big deal, especially in Afghanistan where it's cold and they use a lot of outdoor heaters, and pediatric burns can be really challenging. And then this is just looking at transfuse patients. Really, pretty much exactly the same if you're local national, so if it's humanitarian care versus a NATO coalition and non-NATO coalition, it's the same amount of people are getting transfused and very similar are getting massive transfusions. Children, I already kind of mentioned that we have the different, uh, you know, we'd see a lot of children. And so you can see in the civilian, less than 12 and greater than 12, uh, a, a high percentage of uh, our casualties were less than 12 years old, and then there's a male-female breakdown. They had a higher rate of dying in the facility. Part of that is because we couldn't transfer them anywhere, and so we managed them to their, their end and would bring their families in uh, and then you know, deal with all the kind of social stuff too, which is culturally also can be very challenging. This is, uh, okay, I'm running out of time, so I'll go quickly, but when we looked at the data by mechanism of injury, penetrating, blunt, and burn, you can see that it's higher in the civilian population than the non-NATO coalition partners or co coalition personnel, but then when you take away, when you adjust it, it's actually almost the same. So when you look at injury by body region, so a lot of the uh, non-NATO coalition personnel wear body armor, but some of them don't. The police forces uh, don't. So you know, I don't know if this is a body armor difference or if this is just, this is what war wounds look like. So we do have to compare this more to the uh, US service members too. Okay, blood product usage. This is a, and I'm almost done, Obi. I know I'm running over. So when you look at blood product usage, uh, very similar between the coalition personnel and the civilian. Uh, similar ratios and a lot, a lot of transfused blood products. Uh, last couple things to look at are procedures. 
tons of procedures were, for, were performed. This is looking at x-rays. Uh, these are diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. But what's interesting is between the civilian and the, you know, essentially combatants of police force, the uh, ISAF, and other non-NATO partners, exactly the same percentage. Uh, and then operative procedures also very, very similar between humanitarian, civilian care, and uh, non-NATO coalition personnel. So in summary, the majority of humanitarian care deployed MTSA are battle injuries. We like the expanded medical rules of engagement uh, for both you know, DNBI and of course for trauma. Penetrating trauma is the most common cause. Injury patterns and mortality is similar. Uh, civilian population, more age extremes and more women. And this is very, very resource intense. We don't always plan for it, but it's very resource intense. So the last thing is talking about readiness and the tale of two systems. I already mentioned this is our trauma system. We really rely on this evidence-based performance improvement type of operational cycle of act, learn, and adjust. Obi mentioned that's how we get all of our CPGs. And we've really focused on time in our trauma system. When you look at the civilian trauma system, or excuse me, the host national trauma system, they don't always have these luxuries of time. This is as far as we go with humanitarian care. We can't bring them fixed wing. We can't bring them back to launch stool or back to places like Walter Reed. Matt Martin wrote about the importance of humanitarian surgery almost uh, 15 years ago. We recently looked at the data and can, are gonna continue to analyze the data and hopefully it can inform things like uh, you know, uh, humanitarian care in Ukraine. So important for clinical readiness and for mission readiness. This is part of the mission and you can get medical intelligence as well. It builds trauma capability and capacity and, uh, and we always hope that there's liberal medical rules of engagements, but it really depends on the tactical and operational environment. Humanitarian care is likely underappreciated. We absolutely, as military surgeons, need to be prepared for that mission. And it really makes the uh, wartime experience more bearable when you're able to do this. And so this is a quote uh, from Kenji, actually. One of the most fulfilling things a surgeon can do is to give back to society, providing care for those in need and teaching others how to do it. Obviously, uh, people from, from LA uh, General Hospital are participating in humanitarian care and humanitarian war surgery uh, that current with current conflicts in Ukraine. I'm sorry I went over. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I appreciate the privilege.